Prior to Next Evolution being announced, we were in Marvel Champions Darkest Hour. We just had the really amazing X-Men wave, but we didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what the next products were. If anything, what was going to be released? There were no announcements. We were, you know, kind of left in the dark. But lo and behold, it turned out to be some, you know, behind the scenes stuff. There was a new designer on the block, and this is their first expansion. That designer is Tony, Tony Fanchi, I think it is. And it's a really very good expansion, I'm going to say right off the bat. But we're not just talking about the expansion here. We're talking about the whole wave in this video. Kind of a review, kind of a retrospective looking back with the advantage of, you know, having played it for quite a few months now. So I'm really excited to get into it. And we're going to start by talking about all the villainous stuff. Up first, we have Morlock Siege, and there are actually potentially seven different villains here, and you will fight three of them in any given scenario. It's a bit like Mansion Attack, you know, you'll fight one of these villains at a time, but the fact that there are seven offers so much replayability is really interesting, and it's, yeah, I'm a big fan of that. And now the gist of this scenario is that the Marauders, who are the villains, are trying to break into the Morlocks' kind of base, their little hideout, and after a few turns, they do, and that's when the scenario shifts into the kind of protect the VIP kind of thing, and I kind of like it. It's like the Sabretooth scenario from the previous expansion, Mutant Genesis, but better basically on every count. Sabretooth, you know, he healed every time he activated, but you had to defend the Senator, so you're kind of being slowed down on two fronts, and just being slowed down isn't the best thing in general. I don't mind it kind of as a challenge, but to be slowed down from two different angles together, it just, it felt like a bit of a slog, especially for a first scenario. It's a bit of a, a slow start, but this scenario doesn't suffer from any of that. The Morlocks are much more useful than the Senator. There are certain features that help you, and I do think it makes it a little bit easy in that regard. The scenario overall is definitely one of the easier in the game, I would say, probably top five easiest scenarios, um, but nonetheless, very well made throughout really like it and i've noted on here that it has scenario specific allies you do get two morlocks in solo play in multiplayer you get one morlock each and you lose if they are all defeated so you know got to try and keep them uh you know healthy but i mention this because it will interrupt things such as avenger decks where you are you know using things like mighty avengers and avengers town and you want all your allies to be avengers and it's a very small downside and it's only going to affect a small percentage of decks but it is worth noting because this is the campaign expansion which has a lot of scenario specific allies that are going to start messing up kind of the uh i would say the balance of your decks and that is one of the biggest downsides in fact it's probably the biggest downside so i'll just get that out of the way feels pretty fine in morlock siege not a big deal it makes a lot of sense and overall really really like it Next, we have On the Run, which is the second Marauder scenario. It also uses those seven potential Marauder villains that you could get in, but rather than fight three of them, sort of one by one, it takes a single one of those villains and makes it into sort of a proper full-size uh, villain. And I really like that. Again, it has lots of replayability. Now, the advantage Morlock Siege has is if the villain who is out facing you is kind of, you know, counters your character a bit, isn't good for your deck, they don't have that much health. You can kind of rush them down, move on to the next one. Whereas in this scenario, if your random villain you get tends out to be really nasty for you, you have to fight them for the entire scenario. But I just think that is a little small detriment. The second detriment is there is this encounter card called Favored Weapon, which is kind of like fanaticism from Ronan, except it doesn't surge. But to get rid of it is very difficult. You basically have to not take damage from an attack, except it's giving the villain extra attack. So if you're a one defense hero or even a two defense, it's going to be pretty difficult overall, unless you, you know have one of those nice defense cards uh, built into your deck. But again, not every character is going to have that, not every aspect, and it's very annoying when they have it. Now, the scenario itself is actually really, really fun. It reminds me of the Green Goblin Mutagen Formula scenario, in that it's very minion heavy, but the Mutagen Formula is kind of going to swarm you. This is a bit steadier in how the minions kind of, you know, appear in that. But what I think is also similar, there's like a side scheme with very low threat, but when you defeat it, minions come in. It's kind of a trap kind of thing, just like any mutagen formula scenario. And I do like it. I love the mutagen formula scenario, so naturally I like on the run scenario. No scenario specific ally here. The only scenario in the box without one of those. So it's really nice to just, you know, bring any kind of deck against. And this is the scenario you can really bring any kind of deck you like against, and it will probably work really well. So very accessible, probably my most played scenario in the box for that reason. Next we have Juggernaut, and this is kind of a, I don't know what you want to call it, a bruiser scenario, a brawler, a deathmatch. He's, it's a big showdown where Juggernaut just wants to hurt you, and it's pretty interesting how far they've taken that, because you cannot lose the threat. If the main scheme goes over, he just attacks you again, and other things happen as well, but generally he's just out for blood, 
and it's very fun in that respect. It's also extremely thematic. I really like the theme of, you know, Morlock Siege that we just talked about uh, at first because you're having to defend as Morlocks. I like the way they kind of break in and then, you know, you have to turn. It, turns, it changes halfway, if you know what I mean. And with Juggernaut, what they've done is the main mechanic in this scenario is all about his helmet. And if you've watched, you know, the cartoons, or if you've read the comics, you know that when Juggernaut takes his helmet off, he's quite exposed. His mind is exposed. But when he's got the helmet on, he's basically unstoppable force, which is kind of his power in general. He's the Juggernaut, don't you know? And he has overkill and Star War normally with that helmet on. But as soon as you get that helmet off, his attack, you know, goes down when he loses momentum counters. He's now vulnerable to stuns, confuses. He takes extra damage from cards with a mental resource icon. And he's not got overkill, which is a great relief for a lot of the decks I play. I can tell you that much. And it's pretty fun how they've done it. You know, it really feels like, you know, you're fighting to get that helmet off. And then Juggernaut is, of course, trying to get it back. So it hits the theme perfectly, I'd say. Now, most people, I think Juggernaut is their favorite scenario from this expansion. I've seen it in polls everywhere. I've seen it in comment sections and various discussions on different, you know, social media. I'm not a huge fan of Juggernaut. And I do really like Juggernaut, but not as much as most people. This is the scenario in the box, I think, which has the lowest variety. And yes, we just talked about two scenarios which have multiple villain choices and so on. So maybe it's not the fairest comparison. And yet, I think compared to most scenarios in the game, this one is kind of the most samey. He has 18 cards in his encounter set, but about five or six are, you know, each version of Juggernaut, the main scheme, the helmet, and so on. Five of them, and there are slight variants in how they work, but five of them are basically just trying to make you take damage equal to Juggernaut's attack stat. Three of them are just trying to put his helmet back on, which leaves you with only really a couple of encounter cards that do anything different. So there's very low variety in what Juggernaut is trying to do, and it does make sense for Juggernaut, but to me, it's not the most exciting thing. I think you can play 10 games against Juggernaut and you'll have 10 very similar experiences uh, with very similar encounter cards coming up, you know, quite a lot. Whereas if you play any of the other scenarios in this box or scenarios in general, things will play out quite a bit differently, you know, to varying degrees, but Juggernaut, I think, is on the lower side. So first time you fight him, he might feel like a 10 out of 10, but I feel like the 20th time you fight him, and I understand not everyone's going to be playing him quite that often, but for me, someone who plays like a lot of the time, I just... I don't feel like Juggernaut has a lot new to show me, and he is the scenario which first introduces the Hope Summers ally, who is always in play. So again, this is a scenario-specific ally, and I'll talk about her more in a moment. I do think she's quite a big detriment, but I don't want to derail the Juggernaut scenario sort of discussion. Juggernaut, very, very fun, but a little bit kind of samey and repetitive. I think what really elevates Juggernaut is his recommended modular set, which is Black Tom Cassidy. And it's a really, really good modular set. But put in a kind of an average modular set, I'd say, and then Juggernaut, I think, feels quite a bit more average. And that might sound obvious, but you can take any villain and give them a really fun modular set. And, you know, I cannot rate Juggernaut based on the recommended modular set alone. So that is what hurts it most for me, but still very good. So the hope problem, it is a variety of factors. For the first part, we need to talk about Hope Summers. She has no forwarding and attack score of her own, but she duplicates whatever attack and forwarding your hero has. The first problem to me is how her stats, you know, mimic the hero stats, as I just kind of said. So heroes with big stats get huge advantages from Hope Summers. Heroes with small stats get a lot smaller advantages. Now, there is a case to say characters, you know, like Hulk, She-Hulk, a lot of the characters with a big attack stat are actually considered among maybe the weaker, at least in solo, a little bit more, a little bit more challenged in certain ways. So maybe it's fine that Hope helps them out more. But it's not strictly a one-to-one -one that, you know, weaker heroes have bigger stats. There are some strong heroes with big stats. And even then, heroes like Hulk and She-Hulk, their big weakness is their lack of threat removal. And since she duplicates their basic forwarding stat, it's, yeah, it's kind of rough on that front. She doesn't help them in that way. Now, the bigger problem I have, especially someone who mostly plays, I would say, two-player more than solo, is that, and, you know, three and four-player as well, is that leadership or just ally-based decks in general Go a little bit crazy with Hope Summers. So let's say I'm playing a leadership Avengers deck with Mighty Avengers and Avengers Tower. Hope Summers is going to break all of those because she doesn't have the right traits. And what's a little bit frustrating here is that the basic ally version of Hope Summers has this ability to duplicate the traits of the hero that controls her, which would completely solve this problem. So if you want to take some of the old heroes and, you know, Avenger kind of builds or Guardian builds, things like that, that want you to have all the same type of ally, these scenarios, which is the Juggernaut scenario, but also I should say Hope is in the next two scenarios as well. So if you want to play Juggernaut or either of the next two scenarios with an Avengers leadership deck, 
for a Guardian's Leadership deck, it's probably not going to work the way you think it will, especially in solo play where you always have hope. So it's breaking your toys every single turn. Now you could just say, oh, that's pretty niche. You know, don't just, just don't play those couple of decks against, uh, you know, the scenarios which have Hope Summers in them. But she's also really, really good with any kind of deck that has lots of ally upgrades or maybe even a Voltron deck that has tons and tons of upgrades because you can put them on Hope Summers. She has no consequential damage. She'll usually have pretty good stats copying yours. So she becomes extremely, extremely powerful. And this isn't just, you know, leadership with leadership kind of upgrades. You can do this in uh, aggression with the X-Men upgrades or justice with the mission training there. They just power up Hope Summers immensely. If you have game time, things just go, you know, completely off the rails and you've basically one and you could just say oh don't play those decks with upgrades against hope summer so okay another couple of archetypes ruled out but the thing is some of the most powerful decks for the x-men heroes which are really thematic to fight against juggernaut and some of these other villains coming up uh some of the best ones use a lot of those training upgrades on allies but any kind of leadership deck with readying or again i mentioned game time as well is also going to be really powerful with hope summers because again no consequential damage you can ready her up use her again with absolutely no downside then we've got cards like strength in numbers which exhaust allies to draw cards well now you've got one extra ally not counting against your ally limit so strength in numbers decks get even more powerful with hope summers around and then I've already kind of touched on X-Men decks, but you can even go further into it with leadership builders around it. And even X-Force with Uncanny X-Force, Hope Summers is just a big benefit to have on the board. So basically I would say, I don't know, 70% of leadership decks, at least the ones I play, have kind of big issues when Hope Summers is around. Either it's gonna disrupt them, or it's going to turn Hope Summers into an absolute powerhouse, which is gonna kind of, it's gonna kind of skew the balance of those scenarios that she's in. So. I don't love that. That's really kind of unfortunate in my eyes. I don't really enjoy that. But the final issue is that I like Hope Summers. I actually really like this uh, mod set that she comes in. You can use it outside these uh, scenarios, which we'll talk about later. But I don't really like that she's a forced inclusion in three out of five scenarios in the box because in the campaign, it makes sense. The campaign is basically all centered around Hope Summers. Now, take things to standalone mode. Let's say I want to send Hulk up against Juggernaut or Colossus. I want a, you know, Clash of the Titans. Why is Hope Summers there? And, you know, even in the following scenarios, why is Hope Summers always around? I think part of the beauty of Marvel Champions is playing in standalone mode, changing the modular sets up, playing different heroes, making your kind of own story and own situation. But Hope Summers just has to be here all the time. And Morlocks make sense in Morlock Siege. The whole scenario is centered on them, but all these other scenarios are not centered on Hope Summers at all. Yes, yeah, she is built in and interacts with them a little bit, but it isn't quite the same. And I kind of just wish she was only mandatory in campaign mode and they had just designed them slightly differently, not to always include her, but it is what it is. So up next, we have Mr. Sinister, and this is an all-rounder kind of scenario. Lots of, you know, side schemes, minions, that kind of thing. He's kind of uh, hitting you on all fronts. But when you get to the final main scheme, it turns into another protective VIP scenario, a bit like Morlock Siege, because Mr. Sinister will start to target Hope Summers. And if Hope Summers leaves the game, you lose. So <laughs> that's pretty scary. And he will often get to his third main scheme because this is a very high threat pressure scenario. So he's always trying to push through his first couple of main schemes, which also help power him up with these really interesting superpower mod sets. We're going to talk about those a little bit later, but they basically change his stats, give him different keywords like overkill and retaliate. So he's trying to push through the main schemes to power up. And then on the final one, he's targeting hope. So I really like that kind of progressive difficulty increase. I like that it's not just, oh, I flipped him from stage two to stage three or stage one to stage two. Then he gets more powerful. I like that he's also, as he advances through his main schemes, he will get even stronger that way. And often, you know, there is some advantage when the, uh, villain gets past their main scheme but normally I would say it feels like you failed to contain it on the first sort of stage of the main scheme with Mr. Sinister he's really pushing through it and it almost feels inevitable and there are situations where it is stoppable but definitely in solo play especially if you want to play something like aggression or protection he's usually going to be getting through the first couple of main schemes and you know that's fine I think it's interesting I like that you not, cannot just sit around the villain is really striving to achieve something more than they you know normally feel like i would say so i really like that i like that depending on what superpower modular sets you find he will have different stats it makes him very replayable my smaller critique is that the threat pressure feels maybe slightly too high in solo or do i do still think he's very beatable in solo it might just take a little bit of practice or slightly different deck building that kind of thing but it feels significantly more manageable from two to four player so small thing there but overall really really like the scenario as well and then we have strife 
who's a very fun. This is a true, what I would say, all rounder scenario, but it is reminiscent of Mojo Mania. So he's hitting you on all fronts with minion side schemes and things like that. But you start off with this massive crisis side scheme in play and threats going up on the main scheme. What are you going to do about it? You have to move fast and work on this crisis icon side scheme. And you can also get um, kind of advanced this scenario as well by defeating Strife's first stage as well. But you are going to want to really work on that crisis side scheme. But it is fun. I really like it. I like that you can't just sit around building. You have to kind of get going. I think it's kind of almost reminiscent of the pace of Arkham, I would say. And that is, you know, true again for Major Mania if you've not played that. And I like it. It's fun. And he feels challenging and scary like a final boss should be without being as soul crushingly difficult as a lot of the final villains in scenario boxes tend to be. And there are pros and cons to this. Some people really like this, you know, overwhelming challenge at the end. For me personally, though, I will play those scenarios occasionally, but every time I want to sit down and play my funny superhero game, I don't want to have to fight tooth and nail every turn. So Strife to me gets played a lot more than characters like Ronan and Loki. So I actually think this is maybe a good thing. I don't mind difficult scenarios, but it always feels bad, especially in campaign mode. If you're playing, you know, for kind of, you know, decently difficult, slightly easy scenarios, then suddenly you're hit with this kind of nightmare scenario. And like, you know, what is going on? Why has this happened? So I actually think Strife has a nice kind of difficulty curve compared to the other uh, scenarios in the box. So I actually like that. And when you do get rid of the crisis uh, icon side scheme, uh, you know, or you defeat him, uh, his first stage, things shift about the main scheme changes. And suddenly you have a bigger hand size, but all your cards cost more. That's such a fun dynamic change to the game. I really, really like that. And the other main thing that goes in with Strife is he wants you to count cards. So having too many of one card type in your hand can be detrimental because it can boost his attack. It can add extra threat to the main scheme. It can interact with a few encounter cards as well. So I actually think that's a really fun mechanic. The downside is it means you need to count cards quite often, which in like say a four player game, it's just a little bit of a chore. Everyone has to stop a count a little bit all the time, but not too bad. I think the positives outweigh the negatives overall and I think it makes it a very uniquely designed scenario and I really really enjoy it. The big downside here again is the Hope Summers ally that honestly if she was just in one scenario it wouldn't be too big of a deal but the fact she dominates this box and you have to keep having her in play it just makes things just slightly wonky in my opinion just slightly just slightly undesirable. I wish she wasn't in these scenarios but she is. It is what it is. So Overall, I really, really like every scenario here, and I was going to try and rank them, but I think that would do an injustice to them. Juggernaut, hmm, my least favorite, I would say, but I still really like playing him. All the other scenarios are really, really strong. Again, on the run, probably my most played because it's just very accessible. There's none of those, you know, forced allies to deal with, anything like that. Any kind of deck can have a lot of fun there and do well. So that is how I would probably kind of, you know, judge these but all very good. Up next, we have campaign mode, and I actually love this campaign, and the numbers here might not look like the most flattering numbers in the world, but getting 5 out of 10 for story for a Marvel Champions expansion box, you know, I don't think having one page of about 10 lines of dialogue in a kind of comic book style is the best thing for a deep and meaningful story. They are generally just kind of, you know, I don't want to say excuses, but you know, they're just kind of just nudging you from scenario to scenario, fight to fight. It's not that deep. It's not super engaging, but it's, it's fun, you know? So five out of 10 is kind of what I've come to expect. It's, you know, you are not generally playing at Marvel Champions for the kind of story experience in the campaign book, I would say. You might like the campaign mode, but you're definitely, you know, you're not reading that story, that comic every time thinking, you know, this is the most unique, amazing thing in the world. That is just kind of how it is, at least in my opinion. Now, the mechanics here are given seven out of 10. And again, 7 out of 10 is maybe not a bad score, but you might be thinking, oh, isn't it, isn't it better than that? But I don't think Marvel Champions is really designed for campaign mode. If you've played campaign mode in other games, and the direct kind of comparison would be uh, Arkham Horror, I would say, another game by the same company, it's just so much better. Marvel Champions really feels like it's designed from a standalone scenario's perspective first, and then kind of has the campaign kind of thing tacked on afterwards. And it's always different. It's never kind of the same thing. It doesn't have like an experience system like Arkham or anything like that. It doesn't really let you make any or at least many choices. They're not that meaningful. It won't change the story overall. It is what it is. You just kind of getting the extra little bonus thing that's kind of slapped on and you kind of just go like it was normal kind of standalone mode. But the way they've kind of put the campaign mode on here, I do like. You basically choose one of these player side schemes and they have a corresponding encounter card that you have to then include in the encounter deck. 
And when you defeat the player side team, you get an amazing bonus. And that bonus will now be available in every scenario going forward. So you're kind of choosing what bonus you think will best suit you, trying to de defeat that player side team to unlock it. But you've also now got a really nasty encounter card coming out to try and you know counter that, kind of fight you. So I think that's fun. It's quite simple, but very elegant. The campaign mode is also really in the player's favor, which I actually think is a good thing. The most common way I play campaign mode, and I think a lot of people play it like this, is they open up the box, they play the campaign once, and you know they'll experience all the scenarios the first way that way. And making these scenarios easier through the campaign is helpful if that's the way people are being introduced to the scenarios. It's kind of a helping hand while you learn how they work. So I actually think that's pretty cool. So yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of this uh, campaign mode. I still don't love campaign modes in Marvel Champions overall, but as they go, I think this is the best one. Next up, we have the minion modulars. There's five in this box and they vary quite a bit. Black Tom Cassidy, who I mentioned in the Juggernaut scenario, uh, that is my favorite one. I think it's really well designed. You've got all these quick strike minions with guard. So they're kind of making you take damage, but also forcing you to deal with them. But if they do damage you, you get stunned. So, you know, or do you just take the quick strike and, you know, get stunned? Do you have a sort of ally block it and you know, avoid the stun, but now it's been an inefficient use of an ally. Really interesting decision making with those creeping willow minions. And then Black Tom Cassidy himself is pretty intimidating. Just all around, probably one of the best modular minion sets in the entire game. Extreme Measures is probably my next favorite here. I think it has some really interesting minions with interesting effects, but it's nothing that has changed the game for me. You know, it's not going to give me experiences in other scenarios that I couldn't really get without it. And the same kind of goes for the other minion modulars in this box. So I had to rank them. Black Tom Cassidy's first. I do really like Extreme Measures. I think Mutant Slayers has a place. I they all have kind of a retaliate, patrol, or guard. Something that kind of forces you to interact with them in a different way, which I do like. But they, they're not that, you know, flashy. You know, they do have an interesting choice as well when they try to attack you. But normally you're probably just going to defeat them before they can ever attack. The Nasty Boys is a good modular if you want kind of a weaker teamwork set or something different. But if it's a bit cobbled together from, you know, different pieces, doesn't feel that cohesive to me. It does have some interesting boost effects. Not a lot of the modulars in this set have that many boost effects. But yeah, it's, it, it is okay. I don't feel like I've lost anything if I didn't have it. A Mutant Interaction actually has some of the most interesting, I would say, minion effects when they attack you in the game. But are they going to get to attack you? There is a side scheme which can help give them tough in that modular set. But otherwise, you know, I think a problem a lot of modular minion sets have is that the minion comes out, you just whack a mole, it, defeat it. It's just a big bag of health. It hasn't actually affected you other than making you deal damage to it. And that's kind of the problem that Mutant Interaction has. And while Mutant Slayers is very similar, they do have those keywords that kind of force different things that I think makes them a bit more interesting. Then we have the other modular sets. I'm not going to rank these against each other. They're too different. So Military Grade is all about attachments. There aren't any minions in that modular set. That makes it fairly unique, makes it a good replacement for under attack against villains like Ultron and Zola. I think it serves a pretty nice purpose. I enjoy having it. And I like the theme of those colors that suppress powers, you know, like from the cartoon show and that, which is pretty timely with X-Men 97 just being out. Highly recommend that. Then we have the Hope Summers modular set, and I ranted about it quite a lot, you know, not that long ago, didn't I? But I actually think this is one of the best modular sets we have ever got, and stay with me here. It's a modular set you can drop into any scenario as a bonus modular set on top of whatever modulars it normally has, and it will make the scenario easier for you. It is basically an easy mode, and I think the game needs an easy mode. There are villains people will just flat out not play or not find fun because they are too difficult for them. You know, Venom, Goblin, and Ronin, there are people, probably a lot of you watching this, that, you know, either don't play them or don't play them very often because it's too difficult. Well, just play them now with the Hope Summer's modular set added in, and you will have a much better time with them. She is quite a powerful help, notably in solo play, and I'm not saying it's going to just help you defeat Venom Goblin straight away if you're having trouble with him, but it is a significant, you know, help. And there are other scenarios kind of in that category. If you just don't want such a difficult time, if there's one video that you're having a bit of trouble with, just throw Hope Summers in there. It's better to play them with help than not play them at all. And Hope Summers herself is kind of fun. An ally you can use that mimics your stats is a really interesting kind of uh, ability, a really cool thing to have. Then kind of on the opposite side, we have Flight, Super Strength, and Telepathy, the modular sets that kind of go with Mr. Sinister. I absolutely love these. If Hope Summers is kind of an easier mode, you can kind of, you know, include it and scenarios to make them easier. These will make scenarios harder. And I like to include these kind of as a bonus modular as well. I will from time to time have them as the, you know, the actual modular set that's recommended. But a lot of the time I'll have a modular set, whether it's recommended or a different one I've chosen. And then I'll add on one of these superpower modulars as well. And these kind of like Hope Summers affect the game from turn one. 
Telepathy will give the villain plus one scheming and a retaliate, which now affects you attacking it, affects how much the threat is going to go up on the main scheme fairly often. Then you've got flight, which adds plus one attack and overkill. Now you cannot block with allies really, or, you know, not efficiently at least, which adds a whole new dynamic to any villain that has that. So, you know, quite like flight, quite like telepathy, quite like super strength. I think these are all fantastic. So if you're playing on standard mode and add Hope Summers in, you're kind of almost playing on, you know, standard minus. It's kind of a slightly easier version. Now, if you're on the opposite end of the spectrum, maybe playing on expert mode and you add in flight, now you're kind of on expert plus without advancing to heroic mode or standard two expert two levels of difficulty, I would say, which is kind of perfect. And unlike standard two and expert two, these are not swinging modular sets. They are really steady. They feel very fair. So I'm a huge, huge fan of them. One of my favorite parts in the whole box. So now we need to talk about the heroes and their aspect cards and also the basic cards, all the stuff the good guys use. And standout thing about this entire wave and the expansion box especially is that it introduces player side schemes, a whole new type of player card, kind of like events, allies, resources, and they work kind of how you'd expect. You pay their cost and that puts them in play and they function just like a normal side scheme, except they don't really have bad effects on them. They're all good effects, but you do have to get through the threat to get that good effect from them. And this just opens up a whole new world in deck building because the way most of the side schemes work is that you defeat them and you get to search your deck or discard pile for something, or as it is for specialized training, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you get to get something that is set aside at the start of the game. But either way, you defeat them and then your board gets stronger, you power up. Now they're really good for multiplayer because everyone gets the benefit from them being defeated and threat removal tools kind of scale up quite well in multiplayer as well, I would say. Things like Overwatch, even the odds, but also you only have to pay the initial cost once. So even while the threat scales per person on these things, the cost doesn't to get them into play in the first place. So absolutely incredible tools for multiplayer, especially if everyone builds around them being present. So everyone can make sure they have a good support card in their deck for build support as one example, as build support brings in support cards. They're also really good for solo play. Now they are better for justice and leadership. They will have an easier time removing the threat from them. But there are some particularly good ones in the other aspects and notably in aggression, there is one which actually uses your basic attack stat to remove threat instead of forwarding that kind of thing. So there are some kind of uh, tools to help the other aspects, but not hugely. I would say justice and leadership definitely benefit from player side schemes the most in solo, but there are plenty of heroes who have really strong threat removal themselves, or some side schemes are worth trying to stretch for and get that threat removed anyway. So definitely they see a lot of play in solo games as well, even if they are better in multiplayer, still extremely good for solo play. And if you're a solo player, I think you're definitely going to want them. And one of the main benefits apart from, you know, getting those rewards is how they kind of function and how they kind of deliver those rewards. They basically make your deck more consistent. So rather than just, you know, play the side scheme, defeat it, get the reward, you could have just played whatever card it was going to find for you for the most part. But having a side scheme that can find it makes it more consistent. In solo play, you might just find a side scheme first and then you can kind of get whatever key card maybe it would find. So let's say superpower training, which finds an upgrade, could find Ant-Man's helmet very early on. That's very good for him. So making it more consistent to find your best cards early is a huge upside. And you can take that to multiplayer and now maybe four people are getting their best card earlier than they would have before. And that's really where a lot of the power kind of lies in some of this stuff. So they are really good and I like them significantly. Now to talk about the heroes and the packs they came in, I thought it'd be fun to rank them. And last but not least, kind of, is Deadpool. And people might have expected this if you've, you know, heard me talk on podcasts and things. Now, I like Deadpool, but he feels a bit like a novelty. And I've not actually talked about him before on the channel, so I go into a bit of detail here. He basically trades his health for huge events, and then he can kind of combo off that as well. But when he's defeated, he isn't actually defeated, at least in hero form. He has this regenerate and degenerate ability, which leaves him at one hit point and turns him to alter ego while adding an acceleration token onto the main scheme rather than being defeated. So that's pretty good. That's basically kind of makes him immortal, except if a boost effect or encounter card, you know, does damage to him in some capacity, then it's just game over. And the combination of all this is that he could do immense amounts of damage very, very quickly by sacrificing his health. He can just ignore the villain attacking him. And that means you can win extremely fast and do extremely well. In some respects, he's one of the most powerful characters in the entire game, but you can also just lose immediately. You can just take an extra damage in Alter Ego that you didn't expect after tanking the villain's attack on, you know, your one hit point left in hero form. And long story short, he is the character which is going to have you kind of defeated out of the blue for most of any character in the entire game as well. 
So in that respect, you could say he's one of the weaker characters, but he's definitely on the stronger side. You can kind of play around it a bit, but the more you play around it, the less you lean into it, I would say. So it's got pros and cons in that respect, but he is, at the end of the day, fun. He is kind of a novelty, I would say. I don't want to say a gimmick, but he's he just plays very unusually. For me, he's kind of settled into the place that you bust him out on occasion because it's a bit of a different experience, but he's not someone that I'm always thinking about. Oh, that could be an interesting deck for him. Oh, I think he'd go really well on his team. He's just Deadpool doing Deadpool things. Every card he has is quite fun, but part of the problem is you can win so fast, you don't even necessarily need all your cards, um, which is an interesting predicament to have. And if you've watched my other videos, you know I'm not that keen on Rush. I think the faster you win, the less of a game missing. You're basically just trying to skip as much of the game as possible to win. And Deadpool, by kind of ignoring attacks to some capacity, is already ignoring a lot of the game. So I just don't think he has that same level of interaction with the villain and scenarios you get in other heroes. And because his game plan of using his own events that, you know, kind of use uh, his lower health or, you know, lower his health is so strong, I think he is quite low variety in terms of deck building and things. There are a few different decks you can do of him and things like that, but ultimately you're Deadpool and you want to do Deadpool things. So for me, he just scores a bit lower on that front, but I don't dislike playing him or anything. Now he comes with in his hero pack that's different to every other character. He comes with a brand new aspect, the pool aspect. So let's talk about that a little bit. Now the pool aspect is really, really fun. A bit like Deadpool, I would say, not a single card in it is boring. They are either all, you know, particularly interesting, they're really, you know, different, it has a lot of combo cards, which interact with other cards, which I always really like. And that kind of makes it a very tactically deep aspect. It's a lot of interesting decision making to be made. It's got cards like plot convenience that can hold cards and you can get them on a, back on a later turn. And simply by existing as a fifth aspect that you can play, and I should know if you're watching this more kind of as a review, I don't think they're going to add either anything new to the pool aspect going forward or not much. I think it's kind of a standalone one off kind of fun kind of mini aspect but you can use this with any hero and there's usually a way that any hero can do kind of, you know, fairly well with it, even if it's going to be maybe one of their weaker aspects at worst, you know, so it is kind of fun in how much it provides for new characters. So I think it's a really, really good value kind of buy in that respect. However, it does have a lot of risky cards. I'd say, in fact, most of its cards come with some kind of risk. And the problem is it's not really equipped to deal with the problems those risks introduce. It causes more trouble for itself than it tends to gain a lot of the time. I think for newer players trying it for the first couple of times, it can lead to a lot of bad experiences because it just has all these kind of cards that make bad things happen and then you can't really capitalize off them as much as you would like to. Now there are you know, exceptions. If you build carefully, you can use some of it quite well in fact, but that kind of lowers the accessibility. People just picking up this pack, trying to put it into characters they like, might have a bit of trouble with it. So a lot of the time you're incentivized to take just the safe pool cards, or at least mostly safe cards. And for an aspect which is meant to be really risky and you know risk reward a bit like Deadpool, that is quite unfortunate. It also has quite weird cards within it, I would say. A lot of the events are kind of one-off, but a lot of the cards as well kind of lack what you would expect an aspect to have. It has a one attack card, and I don't mean oh, one attack, but you can have three copies of it. You can have one attack card in your deck, one copy of it, that's cut upper. So if you're Wolverine, Jubilee, um, Gamora, Miss Marvel, characters that really like to play attack events and get some kind of bonus or synergy with it, you don't really have much of that. But what's worse is the lack of threat removal. There is a one thwarting card as well, and yep, you guessed it, you can only have one of it. And I'll be honest, it does maybe have some solo applications, but it is better for multiplayer. And again, it's just one of it, so it's not consistent. If you want to play a hero with a thwarting stat of one in solo with the pool aspect, well, you're going to have to dig deep into that basic aspect for threat removal. But guess what? You're probably avoiding a lot of the risky stuff too, so you're already building a very basic heavy deck. So... A lot of pool decks tend to just be kind of basic decks with some pool flavor on the side. And I still actually think that's really fun. I think there's a lot of things you can do with it, but it's maybe just slightly unfortunate and not maybe what you were hoping for as a mini aspect that you wanted to apply to different characters. Next up, we have Angel, which might surprise people. People love Angel and I do really like Angel. The gap for me between Deadpool and Angel is pretty big. I love all the other characters we're going to talk about now. So Angel is notable for being very strong out of the box. I think he might have the best pre-con yet, or at least one of them. It's very, very good. And he's a very powerful hero in his own right. A lot of people like that. If you like powerful heroes, you'll like Angel. If you like keeping the pre-con together, then you'll like Angel's pre-con a lot. And he has a sort of multi-form card like Ant-Man and Wasp, but unfolds to have a bigger form. And that's just naturally really, really fun. And changing form in general is fun. So having two hero forms is just really, really good. 
as a hero he's a really high impact event driven hero with big damage but also tons of fording and he's also very difficult to defeat and he's got some really fun sequencing too with his metamorphosis card and you know changing forms using the right events in different forms all about those aerial events so pretty fun in that regard because he's so driven to use those aerial events and thus you know deck build with aerial events I find he kind of likes a little bit in variety, even though there are different ways to play him. It's kind of just like tweaking the same overall plan all the time, but nonetheless, really, really fun as a character. Now, the key deck building games here, and I should say for all these characters, I'm going to be talking about the new cards that come with them that we haven't had previously. I'm not talking about reprints here. The key best things you get here are Taunt, which makes the enemy attack you, but you get to draw cards. That is a protection card. And Render Medical Aid, which is a protection side scheme that heals people once it's defeated. Really interesting cards, Taunt especially. Now, I do think Taunt is quite often overrated. Now, you have to pay to use Taunt, then the villain attacks you, and are three cards going to be worth more than basically the two cards you use to play it and then dealing with the villain's attack? But that aside, I think Taunt is really fun. So that is a huge win. Next, we have Domino from the expansion box itself. I do really like Domino. I think Domino is a lot of people's favorites. I know people will be mad at me for putting her here. And again, I do really like Domino. She's my kind of hero, but I think they've made her too tactical. There's too many options. So Domino is a character that can move cards from her hand to her deck or her sort of discard pile to her hand, or maybe from her discard pile to her deck. Or maybe when she discards cards, because she's all about discarding things from the top of her deck, she can kind of snag that card on one of her support cards and then she can grab it another time. Then it can go to her discard pile, you can move it somewhere else. And what I'm trying to say here is that she is analysis paralysis the character. And even though I'm pretty confident playing her, I get very good results, so on and so forth. It still can take me a while to think through all my options. Take this to multiplayer, and I have never seen a domino player at the table who doesn't slow down the game. And that is, I think, the biggest downside here. That aside, she's a super, super fun hero. Every card is awesome. I really like everything she has. Maybe she has just a bit too much awesome stuff that kind of moves things around. I've said this before in videos and podcasts, she feels a bit more like playing 4D chess than getting lucky. You're kind of moving cards to where you need them to be rather than them happening to be there by luck. So she comes with these cards called Digging Deep and White Fox, which are, I would say, her best deck building games. They're actually uh, basic cards. It's a resource and an ally. When they're discarded from the top of your deck, you get some kind of bonus effect, which is super, super fun. But when that happens unexpectedly, you feel really, really lucky. And when it happens because you've put it up there, you just kind of feel clever. And... I'd wish you kind of had more ways that shuffled them into the deck just to make it more likely you would kind of get them by luck rather than setting them there to be the perfect thing at the perfect time all the time. But maybe that's just me. I still think Domino is a very, very fun hero. And something I should say about Angel, Deadpool and Domino, you can play them in every aspect and have a really good time. And that kind of goes for honestly most of the previous waves uh, heroes, but also this wave's heroes, which I really like. So that's really cool. Offers a lot of variety in general. Then we have X-23 and a bit like Deadpool, I was away when she released, they released together and I wasn't making videos at that point. So I'll talk about her a little bit more here as well. But long story short, she's a fast paced Quicksilver. Now she does have some differences. You build their decks very differently. I think they offer a different experience, but they are all about readying up using those basic stats. And she starts with much better basic stats than Quicksilver. She starts with 240. And while she only has one attack, she can use her claws to get up to free attack. She has lots of readying, particularly with her signature ally, Honey Badger, who she is, you know, kind of built around you can do really well without honey badger but once honey badger is in play she's a complete monster which is pretty fun in all honesty so a bit like captain america she hits the ground running and has these really good basic stats you can use twice because she can ready up immediately uh from turn one which is really good now all her cards are dirt cheap which means you can draw a hand of cards and maybe out of five cards you'll get to play three to four of them on some turns that is really fun the order you use them kind of matters you have to think about that so you're doing a lot of things on every turn and the order you do them makes a lot of difference, which just makes a really engaging play experience that I really enjoy. And like the other characters, she is absolutely incredible in every aspect. Although my, I want to say it's a hot take. I don't think it is. I think it makes sense. But I've seen polls on things that put aggression as her best aspect. For me, I think that's kind of her worst aspect, if I'm honest. And I think that goes at every play account. I think aggression is really good with her. But I just think protection, justice and leadership are really, really good with her. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. But nonetheless, she's good in every aspect. Something I think people were concerned before she came out is that she'd be too much like Wolverine. In the story, in the lore, she is a clone of Wolverine. So you can see the claws here. She gets healing effects as well. And like Wolverine, she takes damage to get a bonus. So you might be thinking, oh, she's just a copy of Wolverine. But she plays nothing like Wolverine. 
yes, she can take damage to get beneficial effects. Yes, that mostly is, you know, to deal damage, but you pay resources to deal damage with like, I don't know, 40 plus characters, you know, like basically every character in the game, you know, and people don't complain about that. So this is no more similar than just paying resources for an effect. Instead, you're paying health, but it's completely different to Wolverine. Wolverine plays attack events uh, for health. X-23 loses health to ready up and gain bigger stats. It's entirely different. And I would say it's more fun than Wolverine. It's more engaging. It's just, I just love it. I think it's really, really fun. Now, the key deck building cards that come with her are specialized training. And I would say the direct approach, there are maybe a couple of other contenders, but honestly, not too much from her deck, except specialized training is phenomenal. And I think everyone kind of needs this card, which is kind of the catch that you don't get too much else useful here. If you've got the rest of the cards in the game, there are some useful reprints here, like Moment of Triumph. But specialized training is a player side scheme that has more threat on average than all the other player side schemes we've got so far. But when you defeat it, you get super, super powerful upgrades to choose from that are set aside at the start of the game. They can boost any one of your stats, including your health. And when you use those stats, including taking damage for the health one, you get to draw a card. So it's kind of a Vengeance Mansion and Heroic Intuition if you pick the Threat Removal one, which is just supremely powerful. It's really, really good, especially in multiplayer when everyone's sort of taking a different one. It kind of feels fun to discuss who gets what. I just think it's a fantastic card on every front. Powerful, interesting, interesting in kind of a team situation. Really, really like it. The direct approach is kind of aggression's answer to Overwatch, I would say, except it's much weaker. It has a one cost associated with it. It's an attached sort of upgrade that goes onto side schemes. Uh, so yeah, it, it's fine. I think it's good to have. It does have really good uses, but it feels kind of bad to me that Overwatch is so much better, but it is what it is. The direct approach goes onto a side scheme. And now when you try to fort it uh, with a basic ability, instead of using your basic fort, use your basic attack. And that's pretty fun, especially, you know, as it's an aggression card, she's an aggression precon. I should specify actually that Domino comes with it just as precon. And if you don't own the spider hand pack, it's actually extremely valuable since it has Overwatch and I think even the odds from that pack, which are basically the best multiplayer threat removal cards in the entire game, bar none. So she's a good pick for that reason. But aggression with X-23, direct approach helps with uh, side schemes. It's not amazing, but I think it's worth having. So I'm kind of mentioning it here as the other thing she has but mainly a specialized training. Then up next, we have Psylocke, and she was almost my first pick. There's only one other hero left, but uh, it was so close. But Psylocke is just, uh, she's fun. She's really fun. I really like her. She's incredibly tactical, a bit like Domino. She has a lot of moving parts. She starts with these two psionic weapons in play that you can kind of exhaust and flip to different sides, do different things in different combos. They change up her stats and her events and change what resource they generate. So you have a lot of interesting decision-making. All her events function differently, depending on what kind of way you have your weapons flipped around and lots of just things to do. You know, you've got all these resources to tap and flip and it's fun to do card things with the cards. And I like that she can have really high falling and really high attack. Arguably, it's too easier to switch between them. Her weapons, you know, each weapon can give plus one attack or plus one falling. With two of them, you can get to free attack or free falling. And it's pretty easy to change them up. Now, the big hero to compare Psylocke like with would be Phoenix. And... Phoenix can also have free falling. She can also have free attack. She's also the only other hero in the game that starts with a psionic trait. So they share a lot in common. But to me, I don't love Phoenix's mechanic of how she unleashes. I think it's a little bit clunky. I think quite often you just don't want to unleash or you just do it right near the end of the game, which is fine. But at least a lot of your hero cards kind of underwhelming. Whereas Psylocke can switch her stats, maybe as an argument to say it's too easy, but I quite enjoy it. And then you can use your events however you want at any point in the game. I just think that's a lot more satisfying if I'm honest. It just feels like I have a lot more freedom, which is really, really fun. Now, her key deck building gains here are Upside the Head and Float Like a Butterfly, in my opinion, which are both Justice cards. She comes with a Justice Precon. Upside the Head confuses the villain when you attack them. Or if they're confused already, it stuns them. So as, unlike most cards that confuse the enemy, it's not wasted if the enemy is already confused, which is huge. Then we have Float Like a Butterfly, which is an upgrade which will sit on the board and Whenever you attack a confused enemy, either you or an ally you control, they will take plus one damage, which is enormous. It's kind of like boot camp and hone technique, just a little bit. Every way you're trying to damage, you know, events, basic attacks, allies, everything's just doing a little bit extra damage. So confuse the villain, have float like a butterfly out, attack with everything you've got, and they will take a ton of damage. This is a really fun, kind of more aggressive archetype that Justice didn't really have before. And it's really fun, especially in multiplayer. You can hand out float like a butterfly to other players. So I just think it's a, it's a huge, huge gain. So I think if you're buying any of these products to increase your deck building, 
the next evolution of expansion is going to be the best one just for the player side schemes and you know digging deep and white fox from domino but the next best one would be Sark because upside the head and float like a butterfly are so so impactful i really like them and then in first place we have cable he's the other hero from the next evolution box and i absolutely love playing him he's very tactical as well maybe not as complicated as Psylock and domino but still you have a lot of interesting decisions to make especially at the start of the game because you get to put a player side scheme into play straight away so not only do you get to choose between let's say five different player side schemes for which one you want in play but when you defeat that player side scheme it might have several choices of cards that could find and fetch for you which gives it just you know it's choices nested in choices that you're guaranteed to have on the board from turn one which is super fun he readies up when you defeat side schemes we all like readying and i've said this before in my favorite heroes video in which he scored pretty high uh he is the ultimate build hero for me so most you know build heroes they just want to play lots of upgrades on the board We're talking characters like iron man and that cable can get lots of upgrades on the board but really he powers up when he defeats player side schemes what i haven't said actually and i should is that basically all player side schemes end up in the victory display which means you use them once and then they're kind of gone for the rest of the game now cable powers up for each player side team in the victory display so rather than build up this you know board in front of you of all these upgrades you look into the victory display and everything in there is just pairing up his events it's pairing up his like plasma rifle uh upgrade things like that i just think it's a really different way to build rather than just pay resources to get the thing you're having to go out and fight and fought and earn that kind of benefit which can also you know just defeating them can get you upgrades on the board anyway it's just a really fun combination that feels really really good to me and he is really good in solo play I like kind of the decision making, you know, how many, you know, resources can I dedicate to removing this player side scheme that I've introduced compared to, you know, just controlling the board or pushing forward on the villain. But take it to multiplayer and he is probably the best or one of the best support characters in the entire game. Bring up the player side schemes and being really good at defeating them helps everyone else get the benefits from them, which is super satisfying and everyone will love you. Now, his deck that he comes with in Next Evolution apart from the player side schemes doesn't have as much to offer generally as i would say dominos does but nonetheless it comes with uncanny x-force which is a new kind of leadership archetype it's a support card that benefits your x-force allies and helps them fort especially against side schemes the downside is i think there's only arguably two characters that want to run uncanny x-force of the x-force heroes that being cable and psylocke domino kind of can i mean deadpool kind of can it's it's just not ideal it's not you know that common i would say so a little bit unfortunate but it is a new kind of archetype in leadership and it does suit the characters it suits very very well so overall we end up like this deadpool yeah play him occasionally he's fine he's fun whatever angel domino i really like these characters they maybe just have something slightly about them that kind of makes me want to play them slightly less than the other three but x23 Sulloch, and cable and honestly still domino and angel just anyone hands them to me says play these characters i would be super happy to do so really really fun tons of variety tons of options really fun turn to turn honestly just fantastic heroes all around and that kind of brings us to my overall thoughts kind of at the end here concluding now overall fantastic heroes as we've just kind of covered player side schemes are amazing i am a huge huge fan of them and they have changed deck building forever now the downside is i think the aspect cards aside from player side schemes aren't that impressive this expansion this kind of wave there are a couple of standout cards you know digging deep white fox upside the head float like a butterfly those are the ones i would say are the best here and taunt is really fun but maybe not as broadly usable as you would like and that's kind of the problem with the other uh, new cards introduced here they're just maybe not that usable or the kind of niche they're just if you go back to other characters you used to play and try to include some new cards you're probably going to include maybe a couple of player size games that kind of thing but aside from specific heroes i don't think outside of the cards i named here there's that much you're going to be using from the new stuff on them at least not that often or the ones that you will use won't be making a big impact so there are some things that make a difference here but it's not kind of going to compare to i would say the sinister motives wave or the rise of red skull wave now we already talked about the portal aspect i just think it missed the mark people expect like this quirky kind of fun aspect that's going to always oh, going to make me like deadpool i'm going to get to do fun deadpool stuff instead i think they kind of felt punished for trying to use the risky fun stuff and it just kind of feels bad in that regard now i like the kind of difficult tactical kind of side of thing i actually really like playing with the pool aspect but i think it could have been more than it is and i understand why people aren't generally that thrilled with it so it is what it is in that regard now i do think the scenarios are incredible one of the highlights of the box and i do like those modular sets as well i think the superpower ones in particular stand out to me so scenarios all really good i don't think any of them make my top five scenarios but I also think they all make my top 20 scenarios. So they're all very strong. I think this is the first expansion where I have truly liked 
every scenario. Now, I just, just wish Hope Summers wasn't in them. I think it's the best campaign yet. Still don't love campaigns in Marvel Champions overall. I'm not going to, you know, suddenly start playing them all the time, but they are pretty fun. This one is particularly fun. So that's cool. It's very elegant and some really interesting card design in general, actually, I should say. I think what stands out about Tony as a designer is he likes, you know, tactical stuff and he likes cards that interact with other cards in interesting ways. And for me, that is what I really like to play with as well. So this was a huge win overall. I think for their first expansion uh, made for Marvel Champions, this is a slam dunk, honestly. So while I focused, you know, quite a lot on some of the negatives here, I think it's a bit more interesting just saying, oh, it's good because it is good. So I've been a bit picky with the stuff I dislike or think could be better. But overall, this is fantastic. And I think one of the best expansions and waves Marvel Champions has ever had. And yeah, that about does it. If you've enjoyed this, make sure to smash that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. There's links to my Discord server below as well if you're interested. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye.